Now we'll look at the, the second reading, which is from Second Peter in the first chapter. First, we're going to be reading verses 16 to 19. That's the, the verses they've selected. And you see, it's about the transfiguration. Now, you know, we have trouble sometimes. Is this Second Peter really by Peter? No, you know, why not? But there are stylistic differences that, for instance, this Greek is not at the same elevated level of First Peter. It could be, you know, that Peter dictated the first one and wrote the second one. Because being a Galilean fisherman, you wouldn't expect him to, to sound like Demosthenes, you know. Um, in any event, it's beautiful. Um, so the text reads, um, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw his majesty, how it radiated out through his body. We can bear witness to that. Uh, of course, you know, this presumes that it's written by Peter uh, and not somebody who's sort of voicing it for Peter. And I think that's a very powerful consideration. Because uh, these people who write the New Testament, they're not liars or plagiarizers. Anyway, the text goes, um, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's his, his, his permanent power and his coming at the end of time. But we told you what this was like because we ourselves had an anticipation of it. And that's what he's saying now, you see. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So he's referring to the text we just looked at, the transfiguration, and the one we'll just look at in all three Gospels, you see. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You notice? The radiance of the body of Christ. The prophetic message shares in that radiance. You see? Uh, you do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now can you see, this is the foundation for the whole prayer tradition of East and West to link the transforming effect of the Holy Spirit on us with the transfiguration. Do we see the smile on the face of Christ we also see his radiance and his glory in anticipation. And so he's saying, we saw this. And as you know, if you look at the synoptics, you see, Jesus starts, does this after he's already predicted his passion. And now the apostles need strengthening. If they still denied him, imagine what would have happened if they didn't have this imprinted on their on their spirit, the radiance and the beauty and the voice. Uh, and now, as we're going to see when we look uh, further down uh, on the three accounts in the Gospels, you see, this is, um, it has to happen to us one way or the other. If we'll allow the Lord to mature us, if we'll seek his face, if we'll obey him, if we'll care for him in the poor and the destitute and the downtrodden and the suffering and the sick, all those people he, he listed in Matthew 25, and you, I was sick, you visited me, I was hungry, you fed me, I was naked, you clothed me. When we see him there, that means when we die, we will see his glory. His glory. Well, when did we see you? 
whenever you did any of that to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So come, enjoy the joy of your Lord and see who I really am. And as I say, in the prayer tradition of both East and West, there are moments when uh, Jesus is seen this way to encourage us, to strengthen our faith, and to help us. And so, uh, that's what he's saying here, you see. Moreover, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. That's the gospel. You will do well to be attentive to it as a lamp shining in a dark place. The words of Jesus, the gospel, are a lamp shining in this world. And if we will let the Lord impress these realities, these words on our own spirit, we will see the face of Christ. It's in this, uh, when I get to that part at the end, the mystical tradition of East and West is that the transfiguration is repeated in our lives when we really begin to understand the scriptures, when we see his face, when we see him shining. He's there in his humanity, and as the fathers of the church, I'm anticipating now a little bit, but as the fathers of the church say, you see, the words of scripture are like the humanity of Christ. And if we pray, those words, like his own body, will be transfigured and filled with light and fill us with life and joy and strength. And so, understanding the scriptures is a, a dimension of the transfiguration. Isn't that beautiful? How did they know that? They experienced it. That's how they knew it. You see? And so, this text is saying, you see, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming. Which coming? All the coming. His birth from Mary, his presence in Palestine, you know, his death, his resurrection, his visiting us from time to time, even on this earth, and finally the great and final coming, when history as we know it will be over, and he will be the Lord, and we will all rejoice with him. That's why you see it's worth it to stay out of sin. And it's worth it for those of us who have to preach to pay the price of a real prayer time, of a real study time, so that people can catch a glimpse and have their own transfiguration, if you will, their own guarantee of who he is and who we will become. And so that's why he says, you see, you will do well to pay attention to this prophetic message as to a light lamp shining in a dark place. That's where the fathers get the idea, you see, that the words of Scripture are the humanity of Christ. And that those words, like the humanity itself at the Transfiguration, can take on a radiance of beauty already in this life. And that's what it means to be reading the Scriptures. We've got to go through the work and all that, you know, but uh, and the historical critical method can, can help us in a, in a level, get, you know, get oriented, you know, and get familiar. But the scriptures come alive when they too are transfigured. And that's what, that, that's the, I guess, unanimous teaching of the patristic tradition. And you see, it comes from a text like this one. We possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. Those are the scriptures. You will be able to do, do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, until you see him. Then you can put the scriptures down and just look at him. You don't need him anymore. But you pray that everybody who comes after you will, will come to see that. You see? Uh, the day dawns and the morning star, that's Jesus rises in your hearts. And that's this second Peter. Uh, and so this is the transfiguration. And as I say, uh, the patristic tradition says 
These words of Scripture, they are the humanity of Christ, but they have to be transfigured before they are radiant and beautiful and powerful. And only the Holy Spirit can transfigure them. But we have to first read them, pay attention to them, and obey them. And little by little, you will start to see the smile on the face of Christ Jesus. You will see these words transfigured and radiant with the reality of Jesus. And that's when Scripture is itself. We have to warm up to that. But only those who are devoted, reading it every day, you know, going through. I remember one of the brothers in the monastery, he was talking about reading Augustine. He said, some days it's just like chewing concrete. It was very graphic. But some days it's just like chewing concrete. But keep at it and beg the Lord to open it up. And that's what the these um, great men of prayer say the relationship between the transfiguration and reading scripture. The humanity and origin is great on this. In fact, I think I have a text here. I think I, yes, I do. Good. This is uh, origin. Down below, the word has other garments. They are not white. They are not as the light. If you ascend the high mountain, you will see his light as well as his garments. The garments of the word are the phrases of Scripture. These words are the clothing of the divine thoughts. Down below, he appears different. But having ascended, he is transfigured. His face, having become as the sun, so it is with his clothing, so it is with the garments. When you are below, they do not shine. That's the words of Scripture. They are not white, but if you ascend, you will see the beauty and the light of the garments and will marvel at the transfigured face of Jesus. Now that man, this is origin, is a mystic, and he knows what he's talking about. You see? And at the end of his life, he was arrested and tortured, and he died as a result. He's, a, he's, a, he's not a martyr, he's a confessor. But can you feel the joy in that? Uh, I'd have to go back, to, well, maybe I will, just in case you want to look it up. Uh, no, I know now. It's it's in the. Um, I think that that's in his big work, uh, the Periarchon. But you, see, the notion is there. That's what we can experience: this transfiguration, when the words of Scripture become radiant, and we understand them, and they are impressing the reality that they bear on our spirit. Still, not in total vision as in heaven. But this is the fruit of Scripture. The, trans, the, the grace of the transfiguration is to have the words of Scripture, which is the flesh of Christ, in this sense I'm talking, the flesh of Christ, become radiant and reveal who He really is. And when that happens, we know Him. We adore Him. And we rejoice in Him. Amen. Amen.